So why are you here? About what? To learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jewish faith and life. It's a good curiosity. It's a good thing to be curious about. And this is 3,330 years since we received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And we have been keeping these commandments since then. So it's, it's, it's something to be curious about. But do you have any specific questions, issues, subjects? ask, in what way does God reveal himself today? It's just to the core. In what way does God reveal himself today? There are two, two things. Um, in the olden days, when God revealed himself, it was a special occasion. Because usually he was not revealed. So when we read about the miracles, we say, wow, that was special. In those days, God revealed himself, but only on special occasions through miracles. Over the years, we got to know God better and understand him more. Now we see the little miracles, everyday miracles, that we didn't notice before. You know, we waited for the big miracle. <laughs> the splitting of the sea. But today, everything is a miracle. That you're here is a miracle, which means you think you arranged it, you called Yoni, you made arrangements, but really it was all part of a divine plan and God is revealed and obvious in everything. So of all the people of Norway, you're the ones who are here. How come? And when do you show up? In the most busy, in the most holy time of the year for, the, for our community. This is not by accident. This is all divine plan. So today God is revealed in divine providence. So instead of, instead of considering, uh, considering events as coincidence, accident, good luck. It's all God. It's his world. He cares about his world. And he makes sure that things go the way they're supposed to, even when we make bad choices. <clears throat> the other thing is, after 3,000 years of studying his laws, we know what he wants. We know how to do it. So we don't need miracles the way they used to in the ancient times to remind us that he exists and that he's God. So we're actually closer to God today than we were in those days. In that sense, the world is godlier than it used to be. It used to be that the average person knew nothing about God, but there were very holy people who knew God very well. But there were a handful of people. The rest of the world was in the dark. Today it's not like that. We don't have such holy people, <laughs> but everybody knows about God. So it has become more of a, of a common experience rather than the exceptional. You still argue what is the right things to do or think or so on. Yes, which is beautiful because we're trying to figure out what exactly does God want? Does he want, to, want us to do it this way or this way? Does he want us to do it today or tomorrow? 
before before sunset or after sunset, you know. So even debating what he wants is so beautiful. It's so alive, <coughs> and that's why that's why the details were not all given, because if everything was written down, we wouldn't have to think. Det han sier her er at Gud ga oss loven for 3300 år siden. Og spørsmålet var hvordan åpenbar Gud seg for oss i dag. Og det Rabbi Friman svarer her er at det at Gud åpenbarer seg, har åpenbarer seg i historien, det er egentlig unntak. Og det skjedde ved spesielle anledninger at Gud åpenbarte seg og kun gjorde sin vilje for oss. Men vi har fått overlevert alt det Gud sier vil at vi skal vite så vi trenger egentlig ikke flere mirakler fordi alt er et mirakel egentlig det er ingenting som er tilfeldig Gud har kontroll over sin verden og det at vi er her er heller ikke tilfeldig så vi trenger ikke på samme måte miraklene slik som vi slik som Gud åpenbart seg for gjennom det store miraklet da han åpnet sjøen for oss sier Fridman men samtidig så har ikke Gud gitt oss alle detaljer derfor er det også fortsatt mulighet til å diskutere og studere det er litt kort det var et kort samtidig veldig bra veldig bra se hva det betyr er at i begynnelsen When God planned to create the world, he planned that this would happen. Here today, before America was even discovered, God planned that we would be here today, that I would be here and that you would be here. This library would be here. It would be the day before Yom Kippur. It was all planned. So there is a divine reason for us to be here today. That's pretty, pretty awesome. What do you think about the secular world uh, in connection with uh, that uh, people that believe in God uh, is not here by accident? What do you think about the secular world? Well, we all have freedom of choice. Huh? We all have freedom of choice. So they, you, you think they also know that God exists, even if they say they don't believe in it? Yes. Right. I was talking to a student once, and he said, I don't believe in God. I said, I, I don't know what God is. He says, I don't either. I said, so what don't you believe in? If, if you don't know what God is, how can you not believe it? So even saying I don't believe means there is something to accept or reject. <clears throat> it's like I say, I don't like you. Well, then obviously I know you. I know you and I can like you or not like you. I can be interested in you or not interested in you. So even the fact that there are people who don't want to believe in God means there's a God that you don't have to believe in. <laughs> you have the option. But I, I think that today there is so much, like I say, secular, the secular world is so unhappy. They don't want to admit why they're not happy, but they're very unhappy. It's it, l when life doesn't have a divine purpose, it's hard to live. Without a purpose, it is hard to live. Every pain, every disappointment, every uh, loss, God forbid, is too much. Can't handle it. So I think that even the secular are by nature starting to believe or wanting to believe that there is something, that there is a plan. We're not just lost on this planet with no direction, with no purpose. 
Alltså det frågan är er ju vad med den sekulära världen som då säger att de inte tror på Gud. Är de också en del av känner de också Gud eller del av Guds plan? Och det har blivit Friedman understryker att du kan ju inte avvisa och säga si att du inte tror på Gud och säga si att du samtidigt att du egentligen har en förhåll till något. Du tror på att att at det är er en Gud. Och visst inte är er en Gud så kan du inte avvisa han. Så det är er ju en intressant tanke. Du måste veta något vad du avvisar i det minste. Men samtidigt lägger Friedman vekt på det som vi gärna kallar den naturliga uppenbaring. As Christians we speak about the natural revelation that's created in all human beings uh, that we are created in the image of God. Uh, alltså det att vi alla egentligen det ligger i oss en längsel efter att finna meningen i livet. Finna the purpose uh, of life. Og det det vill alla ha och därför tror han också att det är er en längsel oss i den sekulära världen att då finna den meningen och finna den Gud. For example, if I told you that I was God, would you believe me? No. no. Why? Because you know something about God and I don't fit that description. <laughs> So you can't say, I don't know anything about God. Yes, you do. At least you know that I'm not. <laughs> that's, that's also a little information, understanding. Right? <clears throat> so what do we know about God? If we're talking about purpose, most people for a long time believe that the purpose is for me to accomplish something, to achieve something good for me in this world or in heaven. But the purpose is that I should become special, that I should get some reward, that I should live forever, something about me. We're realizing that that's a mistake. It can't be that God created the world and it's all about me. If he created the world, (laughs) then it's all about him because he created the world before we existed. So when we do the right thing, when we are honest and when we're, when we're true and when we're kind, all the things that we're supposed to do, of course it helps us be better people, but it does something for the Creator. It means more to him than it does to us. That's why he created the world. Because he loves goodness and kindness. So when we do it, we should really be doing it for him. Because he's the creator. Like most people say today, we need to fix the world. Our job is to fix the world, to make the world better. How did we get that job? Who hired us for that job? And do I need the whole world to get better? I don't even know the whole world. So who needs the world to get better? The creator of the world. He has a bigger interest and a bigger investment than we have. We're only going to be here a couple of years. But he is forever. So when we do the right thing, when we do a mitzvah, when we fulfill his commandments, we shouldn't do it for the reward that we're going to get. We should do it because that's what he created the world for. So it's more important to him than it is to us. And somehow we forgot about that. So here's the point. We're not serving God in order to get what we need. We serve God to give him what he needs. Because if he created the world, he obviously needs something. He didn't create the world for nothing. So instead of thinking about our own reward, instead of looking for God to help us, we have to serve him. So the question should always be, what does he need from me today? 
And if we can do what he needs, that's the best. What else, what else can we ask for? So just a quick little story. This little girl, 12-year-old girl, somehow decided that God was angry at her, and she was very depressed. <coughs> and they went to psychiatrists, and they went to uh, healers, and to didn't get better. So her father asked me to talk to her. So I said to her, God is angry at you? She says, yeah. I said, I'm so jealous. She said, why? I said, because if you can get God angry, you must be very important. <laughs> You're 12 years old. You can get God angry? Well, that means that he watches what you do, that he notices what you do, that he cares about what you do, and that it's so important to him that if you do something wrong, he gets angry at you. You must be very important. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. So if you want to know how much does God care about his world, you know how much? He can even get angry at us. That's how important it is to him. Usually we think, oh, he's angry at me. I got to protect myself. Don't protect yourself. Realize what, what we're seeing here. God is so concerned and so involved that if you do something wrong or even say something wrong, he gets angry. That is such a compliment. <laughs> what makes us so important to him? I don't know. That's the mystery of God. He can care about little things like us. So if we can do something for him, we don't need any more reward than that. The point here is that God is the for for our own eller for verden, for vi er her bare en kort stund, men hva vi kan gjøre for Gud, for verden er Guds. Eh, og derfor skal vi heller ikke søke etter egen belønning eller fortjeneste, men heller spørre hva kan vi gjøre for Gud. Ja. Jeg spør om Gud. Ja. Om, om Gud kan gå til for verden, for oss, alle samme norske. Is it possible that God is crying for the world that he has created? That was the question. Yes. Obviously, everything that we have or we can do comes from him. So if we can cry, he certainly can cry. And if we are sensitive enough to cry, he is certainly sensitive. So we shouldn't think that he is less than human. That's ridiculous. So if we have a sensitivity, he has an infinite sensitivity. So, God gave the Jewish people 613 commandments. The Ten Commandments was just like a sample. <laughs> like a salesman comes with his samples. 613. And every one of them is a pleasure because it means that whatever God needs he asks us to do. So every commandment is another compliment. You can do this for me, you can do this for me, you can do this for me. So every commandment is a, is a reason for happiness. That's why you'll notice that it is the um, 
most serious time of the year, and yet everybody's happy. <laughs> everybody's enthusiastic, everybody's excited, because all these responsibilities are all very big compliments. So when God gives us commandments, it's not a burden, and it's not uh, impossible to fulfill. It's a, it's a compliment, and it's, it's the reason we're here. So if you like being here, and we all do, we don't like the alternative, <laughs> then we should be excited about every opportunity to do something for him. We are here for him. But <clears throat> when God said to the angels, let us create man, the angel said, no, why do you want to create people? They're no good. You have us. We're angels. Isn't that good enough? And God said, no. Angels are not good enough. I want human beings. Now, here's, here's the amazing thing. When God gives us a commandment and we're doing something for him, what happens? Of course, the commandment gets done, which is good. But if a human being is doing what God needs, doesn't that bring us closer to him? So when God creates a human being, we are such tiny, unimportant, insignificant little creatures, and sometimes we're annoying, and sometimes we're bad, and sometimes we're ugly. But when we do something that he needs, doesn't that make us the most precious thing to him. So if he gives us his commandments, he's telling us two things. Like, if I ask you to do me a favor, I'm actually at telling you two things. First of all, I need a favor. I'm asking you to do something because it's, it's important to me. But why am I asking you to do it? especially if I'm God and I can do it myself. So why am I asking you to do it? Because in addition to needing this favor, I also want you in my life. So when God creates us to serve him, it's not selfish. On the contrary, God is saying, I can do this myself. But I don't want to be by myself. I want you in my life. That's the compliment. So it's actually humility, not selfishness. That's very deep. Would you say he loves us? It's more than love. Love is easy. If you're cute, then you're good. I love you. That, that you don't have to be God for that. <laughs> if you're good and nice, and everybody's going to love you. What's, where's, where's the godly part? It's not, it's not that he loves us. Sometimes he doesn't, because we're difficult to love. <laughs> but the fact that he is not content without us. He's God. He's perfect. He's everything. And yet, he needs us in his life, even when he's angry at us. So it's more than love. It's, it's much more. Ja, Gud er altså uforstendig uten oss, på sett og vis. Altså, han trenger oss. 
han skapte oss för att han vill ha ett fällesskap med oss. Det handlar inte bara om att lika oss eller eh, älska oss, men det handlar om att han eh, han på något sätt tränger vår eh, att vi är där för han. Han är avhängig av ett fällesskap med oss. Eh, Rabbi Friedman eh, det han är is a story about the relationship with God and his people and uh, there are a lot of stories where God is angry and where he's loving um, and um, but there was there were also institutions of atonement you are approaching Yom Kippur in a couple of minutes what about atonement in this perspective is there is there a place for atonement is it only good deeds or what is it so first, let's understand what atonement means and, and why it exists. We refer to God as our father or mother. What is that supposed to mean? A father or a mother loves their children, but not always. Sometimes, parents are very angry at their children. You know stories where parents don't talk to their children for 30 years. They're so angry, right? But when a father doesn't talk to his child for 30 years, is he not the father anymore? Is the daughter not the daughter anymore? Or is the son not the son? He is just as much the father and he is just as much the son and the daughter. But there's no love. So what this tells us, just for our own lives, in a family, in a marriage, it's not about love. Love is like candy. Tastes good, feels good. A father is a father and a mother is a mother whether, whether there is love or not. So love is conditional. If you're nice, people love you. If you're not nice, people don't love you. Not even your parents. And that's how it should be. Love should be earned. But the relationship I am your mother, I am your father. That's absolutely unconditional. So a father should be a father even when he hates his child. It's not a sin to hate your child. It's a sin to abandon your child. So when we say God is our father, we don't mean he loves us. We know. <laughs> we know how hard it is to love us. <laughs> But like a father, even when he hates us, he is our father. He is responsible, he cares, and that's why there is forgiveness and atonement. Not because we need to be forgiven. That's only one side of the story. The other side of the story is he wants to forgive us because he can't get rid of us can't get rid of your children. <laughs> You're stuck with them. <laughs> so he wants to forgive us and we want to be forgiven. That means we're still connected. So if you look through the Tanakh, even when God says, I'm sick of you, I, I am disgusted with you, the end is always, but it'll be good in the end. In the end, you'll come back, I'll bring you back. It'll, all, it'll never end. So right now I'm angry at you, but can't stop the relationship. So that's where atonement comes in. So God takes this day of Yom Kippur and he says, today I am offering you forgiveness. Why? Because he wants to. He wants us to come back. Knowing that he wants us to makes us want to also. And that's why you can do atonement and you can beg for forgiveness happily, enthusiastically. 
optimistically. He wants us. We don't have to convince him. <laughs> we don't have to beg and plead. We just have to say yes, and we're back. But in the Tanakh, where people that were so disobedient and that uh, that uh, the earth opened up and they disappeared, and where did they go? And what what was their power? Yeah. So uh, <coughs> they were not forgiven. Why? What is it about uh, sin and unforgiveness? These sort of things that made this happen. Yes. You yes. You can be forgiven in this life. You can be forgiven after life. I don't know what after life means. You can be forgiven in the other world. So what does it mean that God takes you out of the world because you sinned? Either by swallowing up or whatever. It means you, you, you messed up so badly that you can't get back. So you have to start all over again. So you go back to heaven, there you get cleansed of your sins, and then you come back and start all over again with a new life. So it's recycling. <laughs> but also, we have, to, we have to recognize, in those days, when God spoke to people, and you had Moses, and you had the prophets, and you had all these... Um, uh, experiences of God's presence and you couldn't behave yourself that meant you were really really corrupt but today when it's been so long since God gave us the commandments 3,300 years today if a person sins it's not spiteful He's not doing it against God. He doesn't know much about God. So it's a completely different kind of reality. And in God's judgment, he takes everything into consideration. So two people can do the same sin, and one deserves to die, and the other one does not. Depends on the circumstances. That's called judgment. If everybody who sins dies, there's no judgment. It's like you put your finger in the electrical outlet, you're going to get shocked. There's no judgment. <laughs> judgment means sometimes yes, sometimes no. Depends on whether you were willful, whether you were um, spiteful, whether you were arrogant, whether you were ignorant, whether you were accidental. All these things have to be considered. Otherwise, there's no judgment. There's just automatic consequence. So today, there's no need for punishment and for... Because if we sin, we sin out of ignorance. And that's, that's a serious consideration. So we can be a little more optimistic today. We have the opportunity to do everything right, even if until now we did everything wrong. And that's amazing. That's atonement. What would you say, we are here at Kronheis, what would you say is the significance of the Lubavitcher movement compared to other Hasidic or Orthodox uh, Jewish faith and practice? Religious people historically were very committed to improving themselves. Every religion felt that their way was best for themselves. You'll go to heaven, you'll be rewarded, you'll have nirvana, you'll have enlightenment, you'll have virgins. Everybody has their reward that they're looking for. You'll go to heaven, you'll become an angel. 
But if you, if you switch and focus on God, it's God's world, he created it for a reason, shouldn't we be doing what he needs? See, if you think like that, a number of benefits come from that. First of all, you're not so depressed. <laughs> Because when you're thinking about yourself, am I going to get to heaven? It's pretty depressing. Will you? Maybe. Maybe not. You never know for sure. It, it, makes, you, it makes you miserable. So you're happy one minute, you're sad the next minute. It's, it's torture. But if you're here to serve God, even if you have a terrible record, but once in a while, you do something for him, then it's all worthwhile. The opportunity to do something for him, even if the rest of the time I'm bad, that's amazing. Another thing that changes is that if you're really concerned for God's um, plan, then everybody in the world becomes important. It's not just me. So if I am perfect, I'm a saint, I do everything, so that's it? So God is happy with his world? No, because he wants everyone to be involved. So I can't be happy by the fact that I'm a saint, because that's not enough for God. So if I'm thinking only about myself, I'm happy. But we don't think about ourselves. We're here to serve him. And if there is one human being anywhere in the world that does not recognize God, then God is not complete. And if he's not yet happy, then my goodness is not enough. So the community, the Lubavitch community, is very open. It's not just that we, we let you tour the neighborhood. We're, we're excited about it because we have to serve God. We. And if together we can get inspired and do one more thing for him, that's the whole purpose of the whole creation. to be good Jews. And the main purpose of human beings is to be good human beings. So why do you think God chose the Jewish people? It's like, it's like in every society, you have the priests, the, um, the witch doctors, <laughs> the, somebody who is responsible for setting the example. So God chose the Jewish people you be the example. Inspire the world. And for a long time, like maybe 2,000 years, <laughs> we didn't really get a chance to inspire the world because everybody was, uh, everybody was out to kill us. So they weren't, really weren't listening to our, to our message. And, and, and we, we were terrified. We were afraid to say anything. So how did we serve as, a, as an example or as a model? By not quitting. The fact that the Jew didn't quit, despite all the anti-Semitism, despite all the tortures, despite all the discriminations, and all the suffering, never stopped being Jewish. That's a good example. But it's a painful example, and nobody wants to be like that. Nobody says, hey, I'd like to suffer like that too. No, nobody, nobody wants that. <laughs> but today, for the last I don't know how many years, something changed. The whole world wants to know what Jews are, and how do you do this, and what did God say, and what does God want. Now we have a chance to share what, we, what we've learned. Before entering this building, I saw, let's welcome Moshiach or Messiah, um, who, when, and what?
<laughs> you want me to give out all the secrets? <laughs> God promised that in the end the world will be good. Through our efforts, through our experience, through the good times and the bad times, the world will become the way he wants it to be. And who will teach us? Who will guide us in this new way of living in a world that is good? A descendant of King David. Who that is exactly? He's not here yet, so I can't tell you. <clears throat> but that the time has come. The world is so small now. The communication that whatever happens in one side of the world affects the other side of the world. It's an amazing time. And people are really tired of war and of sin and of crime. We just, we just, we can't take it anymore. Enough already. It used to be that every country got excited. Oh, we can go to war. We can beat up somebody. We can take somebody's country from them. Nobody wants it anymore. Nobody wants it. And the only thing we're missing today is true leadership. We don't have a Stalin, who everybody thought was God. We don't have a Hitler. We don't have a Mussolini. We don't even have a De Gaulle. Nobody thinks they have an answer or a leader. So this is a perfect time for a leader to come and show us the right way. Because everybody wants. The only thing we're missing, we're not missing money, we're not missing food. There's plenty of food for everyone on the planet. We're just not good enough to deliver it. So what do we need? Goodness. Who is going to be our teacher and who is going to be the leader of the world when the world becomes good? A descendant of King David who will be the king of Israel and everyone will be guided by his teachings. So the more we do, the sooner he comes. It's not a, it's, he doesn't come by a miracle. He comes because we're ready. We're ready to listen. We're ready to do. We're ready to change. So where is he? It's time. <clears throat> as you know, we are we are a Christian group coming here. As you know, we believe in resurrection also. Uh, and and uh, I have heard also within the Lubavitcher, you have at least some groups have emphasized also the, the faith in resurrection. Uh, and I also heard that maybe your Rebbe will show himself again when you are ready. Is that, is For that sure. something that is common sure. in your... For sure. But resurrection in, uh, in Jewish teaching is the resurrection of every virtuous being that ever existed. And the idea is like this. In order to do good, you have to have a body. A soul is beautiful, but it, it can't do anything. The soul goes to heaven and is rewarded. What does the body get for doing good? The idea of resurrection is that every body that served God deserves a reward as much as the soul. So when will the body get its reward? After Mashiach comes, there will be a resurrection of every body that ever served God properly. So it's going to be a crowded planet. <laughs> or a new planet. Huh? Or a new planet. Yeah. <coughs> but do you believe in the body, soul, and spirit also? Is it a sort of thing? Or is this only body, soul? Uh, because when is the spirit? <coughs> so, I believe. 
perhaps I in Christian Christian faith we believe in body spirit and soul because the spirit yeah. yeah, you can put it like this. The body <coughs> is selfish. Yeah. The spirit is religious. Yeah. The soul is godly. But that's a unity, do you believe that? Yeah. So, uh, what so, so when a person is religious, it's still not godly. Because if he's religious for himself, for his own reward, then he is spiritual. That spirit. Yeah. Godly means I am here for him. Not for my spiritual benefits. So there's the physical, which is the body. There's the spiritual, which is things of spirit. And then there's God. God is not spiritual. Yeah. And he's not physical. He's God. So the body and the spirit need to serve him. And that's why religion itself has not always been good news. Religious people have been very evil. In fact, the worst evil is religious evil because they also think they're right. <laughs> so when you become religiously evil, you're really dangerous. Questions or should we maybe suit? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you allowed to watch any television or use cell phones? Want to recommend a good show? <laughs> <laughs> Something worth watching? <laughs> yes. Look, I mean, we we use all these things. Technology is great. Part of God's creation. If you don't use it, you're sinning. You're leaving it out. You can't leave anything out. Everything is here to serve God. She is asking about your bird <laughs> and your clothing. I mean, we can see who are Jewish here, and we see that there are different ways of presenting yourself with clothes and yeah, so on. Uh, why is it so, she asks. So you can look at the clothing yeah. as old fashioned. Yeah. Or you can look at the clothing as no fashion. <laughs> the reason we dress like this is because we don't believe in fashion. Because every year it changes, every month it changes, you have to wear this, you have to wear that. It, we don't have time for this. So just wear what you wear and do what you need to do and don't get caught up in fashion. It's, it's, it doesn't deserve so much attention. The beard is part of, is part of the uh, commandment. We're commanded not, not to shave the, f the hair on the face. It's one of the 613. Or some guy uh, talking about television. You know the Duck, duck Dynasty? The Duck Hunters? The uh, yeah. huh? Anyway, they, they have long beards. And somebody asked one of them, how come you have a beard? He says, there are two kind of people who don't have beards. Women and children. And I ain't either of them. <laughs> <laughs> So why do we have a beard? Because it grows. <laughs> What's the relationship to the Messianic Jews? Messianic Jews um, are trying to be good Jews. And uh, they think they found a way to do it through the belief in, in Christianity. right? If you think about it, and this is really revolutionary, everything that Christians believe about Jesus 
is really true of all Jews. We are God's son, child. Uh, we are his suffering servants, pierced by the iniquities of others. Uh, we are the message to the world. So the Jewish people can be described exactly the same way that Jesus is described. So as far as we're concerned, Jesus is just an example of a Jew. But all Jews are God's suffering servant. In fact, we've suffered longer. <laughs> we've suffered for 2,000 years. So who is God's suffering servant? The Jewish people. So the, uh, the Messianic Jew needs to appreciate his own people a little more. The prayer, Shona said, oh, wow. and the twelfth prayer within is uh, putting in the Menim. Um, who are the Menim? Are they Muslim as well as Menim or only those? Outside. Who is considered a non-believer or a, a heretic? For the Jew, yeah. any deviation from Judaism is a heretic. So whether it's an atheist or another god or another religion, or if you're not loyal to your mission, then you're a deserter. But would Messianic Jews come into Christian? Yeah. Because the idea that you no longer have to keep the commandments, the only way Mashiach can come is if we keep the commandments. So, see, that's why a Jew cannot convert. To convert means to improve. A Jew who says, I have 613 commandments, but I think I'll just keep seven. <laughs> That's not an option. <laughs> if you want to keep more, you can convert. But to keep less, no. That possibility is not. I think we, uh, it has been, uh, OK, one more. Yeah. By the way, that banging. Yeah. yeah, it's a cobbler. Yeah. It's a guy fixing shoes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe I should be part of the tour. <laughs> Let's discover what's banging over there. I not making tefillin. <laughs> no, it's shoes. <laughs> okay, I think. Yeah, one question. Well, question. I just was wondering about Abraham. It was before the commandments, and he was called a friend of God. What do you think about? He was living without the commandments, and yet was calling the Father God. Yes, beloved. But if you read it, it says clearly, I loved Avraham because he will instruct his children to keep the commandments. I, I, I just read this somewhere. Hmm. Can you please say this again? God says, I love Avraham, I chose Avraham because he will teach his children to keep all the commandments. In other words, he prepared the way. And this is obviously n necessary. First, Avraham taught the world who God is. After the world got to know a little bit about God, then God can give his commandments. But he can't just come and say, I have commandments, like, who are you? So Avraham introduced God and then his grandchildren were ready to receive the commandments from the God of Avraham. So that's why even today we still refer to God as God of Avraham, God of Yitzchak, God of Yaakov. Because they introduced us to God so that God could give us his commandments. He's not a stranger anymore. <clears throat> okay, uh, we have been uh, sitting by the feet of a rabbi teaching us this morning. Thank you so much, Rabbi Friedman, for sharing with us, listening to us.
I, I hope you noticed. I hope you noticed my beard, not my feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the expression that I we know. Uh, <laughs> that we use. But um, I think we have got a lot of new thoughts also, and we have got an introduction in some ways to what uh, you believe, not only for yourself, but for how to, how uh, you have invited us also as non-Jews, how we can live our lives. The purpose of our life is to serve God. This is what we will remember from your teaching. And the coming of Mashiach means that we will all serve God together. Yes. Each in their own way. And we appreciate very much your hospitality and your openness. Uh, it's a pleasure. Here. And we look forward to uh, touring with you also um, in this area. Some of us have been here before, or at least a couple of us. Uh, thank you so much.